but I'll just wait till a few more people come in. But welcome, everyone. Sorry for this slight delay. Um, but we're here and excited about the night uh, in front of us. Let's see, I'll wait a few more minutes for people to come into the room. Brilliant. So welcome to our first in the series of inspirational webinars. Um, very excited to have John Steele here, who's uh, Cafe Direct's CEO and also one of Oxford Brooks alumnus. Um, welcome, John. He's a business leader and social entrepreneur with a passion for making business a force for good. And I'm very delighted also for Professor Tim Vorley to be chairing tonight's webinar. Um, he's the vice uh, <clears throat> pro vice chancellor um, and the dean of the Oxford Brooks um, Business School. So welcome to you both. Tonight we're going to have around 40-45 minutes in conversation between uh, Tim and John and then at the end we'll have time for questions so we'll a lot about 10 minutes at the end so we look forward to hearing any questions you have for the two um, for John particularly and tonight's session is recorded so thank you very much and I'll let you get on and enjoy your evening. Lovely thank you very much Molly for that and, and thank you everyone for joining us and thank you John for for being the, the main attraction, it's great to be able to oh, have you with us. Uh, so you've had the kind of the esteemed introduction. I'm delighted that you're also one of the uh, entrepreneurs in residence currently at the business school. But um, obviously, you've had a kind of a varied career since you've left Brooks. And I just wondered if maybe um, you could tell us a little bit about it and, and enlighten the audience to a bit about you so we, we can understand who, who we're talking to. Wow. Um, well, how long? No, how long have we got again? Um, <laughs> but I, uh, I mean, I yes. Yeah, so I, I'm really pleased to be here because um, I did go to Oxford Brooks University quite a while ago now. But um, I, I absolutely loved it, and um, certainly it's helped me do many, many of the things that I've, I've chosen to do over time. Um, I graduated in <clears throat> 1989, which you know. It's quite a while ago now. And um, I, um, I did the business studies degree and I majored in marketing, um, which was an interesting choice at the time, because I think in the second year I, I came top in finance and got about 57 percent in marketing. But I, I felt at the time and I feel the same way, I guess, that I wanted to run business as something that was market orientated, that's something that faced into consumers and customers and stuff like that. And so I felt it was a kind of right philosophy was to focus on marketing. But hey, it was a close call. Um, and what have I done since? Uh, I, when I graduated, I chose to work in, I wanted to start in one of the world's biggest companies and one of the kind of best companies. So I started at Nestle, the world's biggest food company. Um, yeah, love it, I hate it or whatever, but it was a very um, great place to start as a training ground. So it was very... Um, very disciplined and you were you were heavily invested in as a as a as a graduate so I think that's a very good start and then my journey has been trying to learn about different ways of running businesses I suppose crudely speaking um so I had the privilege of working for Weetabix when it was run by one man called Richard George it's his his company and that was a, a really interesting experience on how one man made decisions versus in Nestle where it's a very um analytical approach to decision making and then I've worked in other food groups either private equity owned or um, large kind of conglomerates and enjoyed working for Marston's the brewers in a period where we were consolidating and buying breweries and being bought by other breweries and things like that which is great from a change point of view um, and then I ran my own business so when I had a, a job in a large food company I decided to stop that and sit in a, a darkened room with a piece of paper and build a business and did that for four years and uh, enjoyed that tremendously, although it, it is terrifying but liberating to have just a, just yourself and no resources and so on. Um, and then I've since then worked in, back in food and drink and spent the last 10 years running a social enterprise called Cafe Direct, which is um, very much a farmer-led organisation trying to change the lives of the farmers that feed us and bring to attention the need for us to run businesses to make social and environmental capital not just money for the few and um so yeah i, I guess a varied career tim built on a great great academic foundation from oxford brooks 
Absolutely. Well, it, it fascinates me because you, you've kind of done both parts and, and obviously you've kind of had the, the career in big business and the shift to kind of starting your own and now to kind of cafe direct as well. But I mean, kind of what have been the kind of the, the challenges in doing that? You obviously were excited enough to kind of um, give up the, the nine to five, so to speak, to do the 24 seven and to really invest in doing your own thing. But what have been the, the kind of the, the, the challenges and what's inspired you during that time? Um, I mean, challenges, I think, um, yeah, every day we're facing challenges, aren't we? Every day we're facing things we need to deal with. So I think um, be, being resilient and being determined is probably the best way to look at challenges. I think um, certainly when, you know, in the brewing industry, when there was kind of rampant consolidation, every six months you were buying companies and dealing with that change or fighting off being bought or being bought, yeah, I think there you've got to very much be very clear what you're able to control and then do the best job you can and be, you know, really content that that's, that's, that's your kind of sphere of influence. There's no point worrying about things that are outside of that, um, which is easier said than done. Um, I think um, in terms of inspirational moments, um, I had the pleasure of working with Lloyd Grossman when we were building his cooking sauce business and I think um, he was very inspirational just because he was so clinical and clear about what mattered. And I think that shone through in the products that uh, the business made for him. So, yeah, I think that that makes you realize that, you know, being very clear and focused and, you know, clinical. Yeah, very, very clear about what matters is a, is a good trait to have and to build. Um, I've always been inspired by my dad. So that's a good thing. Um, and he, you know, even now, and he, he's 84 and very unwell, but, you know, even though he's, you know, struggling with a number of physical ailments, he'll still say to me, you know, what, what is the distribution of Cafe Direct like in Sainsbury's and how many facings have you got and stuff like this, when really he ought to be thinking about other stuff. Um, so true. There you go. And I mean, it fascinates me kind of obviously working with the likes of Nestle and I mean, Weetabix is an interesting one and how it's evolved as an organisation. But that kind of shift, I think one of the things that certainly matters to me and, and the business school, and I guess you, well, I hope you feel this being part of it, is that there is kind of more to this and, and there are things that matter beyond money. And I guess oh, yeah. one of the things through your career, that sense of social purpose, the kind of the all of that seems to have really kind of come to fruition as you've gone through. And was it always there in the background or is it something that's kind of evolved? Uh, I think you've got to say it's evolved, but, um, but I can build on that a little bit. I was going to say the, I think the a thing that would, that's helped me that I think would help everybody is if you always view what you're doing as learning, as long as you look at it through that lens, I think you you'll always progress. And, um, even if it's challenging or if you're working in a very different place or you're working in a startup or whatever, I think if you're curious and determined to learn, that's a, a good lens to look at things through. Um, in terms of business beyond, uh, you know, financial return for the few, as I sort of see it nowadays, um, I certainly when I joined Nestle, I joined uh, Nestle's confectionery division, which was Roundtree Macintosh until Nestle bought it in 1988. And so culturally, you know, Roundtree had a lot of um, good values around it in terms of looking after employees, looking after the communities it served and managing its supply chains. And I think that that probably influenced me as a starting point. And I think probably if you think about Weetabix being a family firm and getting wheat from its local farmers, there were similarities in terms of values there, even though operationally and organizationally they were very different. Um, but I do think the reason it's got, to, I've got to be honest and say it's evolved is, you know, the world has changed beyond all recognition since 18, 1989. I mean, in 1989, what sort of made sense for business then does not make sense now. I think, uh, you know, if you look at climate change and our um, need but inability to adapt to it fast enough, business has a huge role to play in that and the way businesses um, decide what to do and what to do can make a profound difference to, to the way we um, 
tackle climate change and inequality. I mean, I think if you look at reports from people like Oxfam, although absolute poverty is is not as uh, bad as it was 30 years ago, the difference between the haves and the have nots is has exploded beyond all recognition. And um, so inequality and I'm sure we'll see more and more the social disquiet that comes from that is greater than ever before. So I, I do think, I think all the actors in society have a role to play to address these two kind of macro forces in terms of climate and, and social, uh, ultimately unrest. And business is one of those, those forces. I mean, business is a huge influence. And um, yeah, I think that there's, there's a lot of work to be done, but my thinking about it has evolved because the environment and the urgency that the environment is putting upon us has, has, has uh, accelerated and accelerated. So. And can I ask you about that a bit more? Because obviously, if we think about Cafe Direct kind of being conceived, born in, in 1989, and now we're kind of uh, 30 odd years down the road and thinking what this looks like. And I guess, like you say, that social justice, thinking about climate change and is at the core of what you've done. But like you rightly say, that it's a very different world now. And I think mm -hmm. that one of the things that kind of interests me is the scaling here and the positive impact, the force for change, but being ahead of that question, I just wondered, could you give us, tell us some of the stories about what's been going on with kind of Cafe Direct, where you're seeing some of those kind of, those big examples, those big impacts? Um, yeah, okay, let's try and think of two, two things. I mean, I think um, the way the business is governed is quite remarkable so you know the, the business is run as a plc it has a board of directors um but two of those directors are farmers so one is a, a farmer from peru um a guy called raul and then another farmer is a tea farmer from um tanzania levy and uh so i think in terms of leadership you know the business is influenced by you know the stakeholders where you know they are trade we're trading with we're buying tea and coffee and cocoa from but we're also working on the ground to try and change lives and to try and change the landscapes in which those farmers operate in i think that you know so the business is is governed with farmers in leadership with farmers owning um part of the business and we have our own charity that's run by farmers that does all the work on the ground so i think um it's quite a remarkable setup What's what's incredibly frustrating is it's you know this is a relatively small business, um, and much larger businesses could easily afford to make these you know relatively small changes. Um, and uh, so I think personally, uh, you know, the, the being on a board of directors with two very um, diverse voices. I mean, we talk about you know the need for diversity in in boards and in all aspects of life, and it is it makes for a richer more fruitful discussion. I mean, there's some frustrating discussions and all kinds of stuff goes on, but um, I do think it's part of a di diverse population, but it's also part of running a business that genuinely wants to behave differently. So I think governance is key. I think I I'm going to do three things rather than two, so I was wrong there. Um, I think the second thing is some of the work we do where on the ground we help find a smallholder farm so most of food and drink you know uh, over 70 percent of our food and drink comes from farms you know of really really small a, a couple of hectare hectares with a, a, a parents and children um you know looking after the soil on a mountainside in in near the equator and um it's a very very difficult life and um you know what's happened over the colonialization of the the world is many of these farming regions have ended up in monocrops. So they've ended up in tea or coffee or, you know, different um, crops. And uh, that's, in that's actually created a power imbalance and a dependency upon, you know, commodities that then uh, the developed countries buy at quite volatile pricing. And um, some of the work we, we have done is trying to not only look at the quality of the product, but look at the management of those lives and those environments. So, I was at a farm in Peru you know, two and a half years ago before the pandemic where this couple showed you, you know, their coffee bushes, but then they showed you their fish farm. Um, it was in Peru. So they showed you their guinea pig farm. Um, they showed you an amazing vegetable garden. And then they showed you how 
you know, they they used um, uh, the, the 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 whole circle of kind of virtuality between these different components, and they created a diversified business upon which they could have more security. Um, and that, and then um, things like bringing young people into farming in these far flung places is key. So I, I think the thing that's really inspirational and amazing is how close you are, because you know most of the big businesses in the world they would have a purchasing department, they would purchase from an intermediary, that intermediary would be instructed to save money. And then somewhere down the back end of the value chain is a farmer being asked to part with his goods for less than he, um, you know, produce them for. Uh, so I think those two are, are quite inspirational. The third point I was going to make as I ramble on was, um, a, you, you touched on something a minute ago, I think I think what's what needs to happen is the, these businesses need to scale up or or more strictly speaking, industries need to change. So, you know, I think we can be very proud about what Cafe Direct has achieved, but it's still, you know, it's a 20 million pound business in a 2 billion pound market. And um, either it needs to become much, much bigger, or it needs to continue to influence and change the other competitors so that um, business is transacted on a social and environmental and financial basis so you know i was talking to we have a guy uh, nick who's our head of purpose who looks after how we deliver the, the purpose of the organization its social and environmental um uh, mission and he was saying well you know there's an interesting debate between whether it's about making cafe direct more successful or it's about making cafe direct's influence on markets more um successful and, you know, we, we don't need to be a two billion pound enterprise if Nestle and uh, JDE and the other large coffee firms were to change. But, you know, on the other hand, we'd be quite happy to be that scale. I mean, uh, yeah, so I think there's, there's still a, a real need for um, scaling up businesses with purpose. And it's not completely fair to put that at the consumer's um, ask all the time again kind of just listening to you speak there and i guess one of the things that's really interesting is that the business isn't just about kind of reinvesting in kind of small holdings and small farms it is about that kind of that much more holistic approach isn't it and i guess that that's one of the things that in being that kind of flag bearer in this field trying to make a difference is something that kind of really to my mind sees cafe direct kind of stand out yeah i mean we have a a, a construct called the gold standard, which is our kind of method of delivering a triple bottom line. So de delivering social, environmental and financial change. And um, that has four pillars. And one of those pillars is about being an accountable business. That's an example and influences others. So we do have, you know, we have all the normal um, requirements of a commercial business, but we also have requirements to change the lives of growers, influence consumers, um, change the environment and change the role of business. So um, it's quite a um, stimulating kind of job, really. So, yeah. That's it. And, it, and a constantly moving feast. And I, I guess one of the things that kind of um, we, we haven't said, and for those that aren't familiar with what it is, maybe you could explain, but you were certified as one of the kind of the, the first coffee company B Corps, weren't you? Uh, yeah, we, we were the first... Um, UK coffee company to be a B Corps in June 2018. We we would have been a bit earlier, but it was interesting at the time. Um, you know, B Corps came to the UK in 2015. At the time, I think we we were a, a social enterprise. We were you know a founder of Fair Trade. I think we had enough certification for you know most of the meals in the day. So I think we avoided B Corps for a few years. But yeah, we certified and. I mean, for those who maybe many of the, 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 the listeners uh, will know about B Corps, but B Corps is, is a certification for your whole business. So it looks at all aspects of how you run business. And it is quite a, it's a great thing for a business to do because it audits how you perform, really. It audits how you treat your employees, how you treat your suppliers, how your packaging works and so on and so forth. So, you know, we were very pleased to join um, that that community. And I think... We're, we're learning about where we're doing well and where we need to improve, but we're also helping to connect with others too. Yeah. 
So what does the future hold for kind of Cafe Direct? Because obviously things are moving, things are changing. Really interesting to hear about the kind of the diversification of some of those kind of small holdings as well. What's the, the kind of the future for Cafe Direct? Man? What is it? What's coming next? Well, we, we have, if you look at us as a, a commercial business, we've, we've grown for the last seven years in a row and we, we're outperforming the marketplace. So we, we're gaining share and we, we need to do that. I think, you know, 10 years ago, we felt that kind of small was beautiful. But I do think, although you can say, well, there's a, you know, there's a 20 million pound business that has more impact than cost of coffee. That's a hundred times your size commercially. I think we need to be commercially much, much bigger because it's, it's the lens through which people still look at success. And also, Hey, if we, if we um, buy 20,000 tonnes of coffee from our farmers rather than 2,000 tonnes of coffee, then they get more fair trade premiums, they get better prices, they get better um, investment on farms. So, you know, it, it's, it's very important for us to scale. So we'll, we're going to continue to grow um, by being the best class competitor we can. So I think, you know, um, a lot of social enterprises, because they're so mission centric, they end up being very um, socially responsible, almost to the point of being a charity. But you need to remember, you need to outcompete Nestle. You've got to outcompete some of the most sophisticated, well-resourced businesses in the world and still have a model that does the right thing. So I think we've spent the last three years, you know, making sure we've got the best um, systems in place, the best people um, and a very clear strategy. Um, you'll see in the next five years, our, our strategy, we're very much about a very single-minded brand moving out from coffee, um, very much communicating that the world is better when we work together. Um, you know, I think um, part of our job philosophically is to bring people who drink, who buy and drink our products closer to the people who um, till the land and provide them. And the bit in the middle is kind of noise. Um, and I think there's, you know, that will help, I think, people to see the unfairness in society, but also see the richness of diverse communities across the world. So, you know, we, we're going to continue to build a business and communicate that business and share that model. I think it's wonderful to be with, with you, Tim, and, with, and with, with the people here today, because helping people at universities such as Oxford Brooks think about business differently um, I think will be very rewarding for them, but it's hugely important that the leaders of the future grasp very rapidly the need for business to do much more than make money for a, 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 few, a few people. No, absolutely. And it, you talked about the triple line there and obviously mm -hmm. uh, thinking about B Corp, hugely important for kind of, I guess, being the dean of the business school, wanting people to think about how business can be a force for good, thinking about what the, the opportunities are and, and that we don't necessarily need to have business as usual. And I think that that's one of the, the things that doesn't always have to be done the way that it has been done. It's having that kind of foresight, the ambition to try and change things. And I mean, your, your stories there in the sense of kind of uh, bringing, even when it comes back down to the profit share, how you're working with the kind of small farmers is fundamentally about changing that. But I think that the, t the key point is that you are competing um, yeah. It is definitely something that is there alongside Nestle. It's not a charity. And I think that there is this misconception on occasion, isn't there, that, um, that, that charities and businesses are interchangeable. You've got to have a business model that competes. Yeah, no, d definitely. And I think, um, I, th I, think, I think we do. I think we have a very strong culture. I think one of the amazing things about a business with purpose that views businesses' role as, as you know, more than just shareholder primacy is that, it gives you real meaning. So we try and get every employee to meet with producers to go on farm. Uh, we have a board meeting in March where for the first time in two and a half years, we're going to have Raoul and Levy present um, in, in London meeting all the employees. And I think, you know, if you can find a business that's got real meaning, it drives a culture with real values. And that's very distinct and different. So. And, and the values at the core of the business. I love the way that you've got those board representatives, what that brings, but actually bringing them over and that they're meeting kind of colleagues as well. It really kind of embeds and engenders those values, I should imagine. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think, um, 
I can remember going to Peru a few years ago and I took a a brand manager and a, a national account manager, a guy who runs, I think, Waitrose and Tesco's. And um, when he felt what we meant to the farmers and how they saw us as family and how, you know, they really felt without us, you know, life was very difficult and we made a profound difference because we, we weren't trying to get the lowest price and all this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, no, Dario came back, you know, determined to be the best national account manager and to build the Tesco and Waitrose business beyond all compare because he, he really felt the purpose from the people he met and from the, the landscapes he, he, he trod on. So, yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you if people have got any questions or points they want to raise. We've got one through from Abdullah there that I'll, I'll bring up in a minute. So please, um, either in the chat or in the Q&A, do kind of uh, raise those. And I, I'm kind of, uh, do introduce yourself as well. So it's great to have Rose uh, here, who's uh, attending from America. So uh, welcome to, to you. Um, John, while well, we're maybe waiting for a couple of the other questions to come in, I guess one of the things that, um, again, we, we all have inspirational figures. We've talked about the kind of transformation of um, your career, your kind of um, your impact with Cafe Direct. But who do you look to either among your peers or other businesses that you find particularly interesting? Um, yeah, uh, let me just try and think of the right ones. I mean, I think um, as a business, you know, P Patagonia, I'm wearing my little Patagonia organic fair trade T-shirt. I think Patagonia is a very um, big inspiration, I think, because of the the way the organization was founded, the way it lets its employees work. And I think also if you if you look at the company, the way it does, it does two things. It's very provocative and very challenging. So, you know, it challenges the tax regime of, of the states, it challenges um, on, on all the issues it believes, but it really also has the best quality products and it commands great pricing for those products so i think it's it's got the balance of a well differentiated very distinct business with also a very provocative voice that's you know making very clear statements about change and backing that up with behavior too so i think patagonia has been an inspiration for years um uh, in chocolate, it's interesting. So Divine, which is one of the fair trade uh, pioneers alongside ourselves, Sophie Trantrell, who founded Divine in 1998, has been a close friend. And I, I've really admired her, her campaigning delivery of that business's success over time. Um, and I think if you then compare and contrast that with Tony Chocolate Only, which people will have heard as it entered the UK market less than three years ago, and has achieved remarkable success and, and scale. I think it's, you know, there, there are quite big similarities. I think Sophie's campaigning, very, very authentic running of Divine uh, was quite profound. I think Tony's does an absolutely brilliant job of marketing itself and positioning its anti-slave message and then providing a very, um, you know, gorgeous chocolate presented in a very... Um, positive way to make a lot of money for themselves so it's very interesting to watch different businesses um both with similar purposes uh, display very different characteristics so but yeah i think i think those are a couple i mean i think the the team at toast ale which is a a beer business that takes waste bread and makes it into beer they're, they're a great bunch of people and they 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 care so much about what is not only a good model in terms of um waste but it's also you know it's great to have the way that that works as a very good quality product as well and i i can attest to the uh the toast ale as i can to cafe direct as well so uh, <laughs> i won't be endorsing any one supply but across all of those examples again the high quality products very much there and yeah. i think that the, the other thing that kind of really struck me kind of and again with tony Chocoloni as well as yourself is about that kind of the consciousness of, of what's going on and trying to raise that among the consumer. And I think that that is yeah. something that, that we are beginning to see more of to my mind. And I mean, I just wondered mm -hmm. again, as citizens and kind of thinking about that kind of responsibility to the environment, to kind of social justice beyond our doorsteps, kind of, is that something that you're kind of seeing more in the consumers around Cafe Direct? Oh uh, yeah. I mean, I think, um, 
you know, as an optimist, I'm very hopeful that as citizens, we are more conscious of the ability we have to change things through the decisions we make. I mean, I think it's quite a foggy world. It's very hard to navigate on a supermarket shelf or um, online what, what, what businesses are doing. But certainly, um, I feel like we're much more conscious citizens. And I, I'd i like to believe that the pandemic has brought us together and made our values um, more attuned to making a change. I um, mean, you know, I really believe in the in, if we can harness the response we all had to the pandemic to respond with the same urgency and uh, systematic change for climate change, that gives us a really good chance. So I'd, I'd love to see us to take some of those lessons. So. No, absolutely. And I mean, it is something that, again, that whether we're thinking about kind of fair trade, social justice, all of this is, is trying to have that positive impact on the communities but not in a sense that we're just simply trying to raise up it is one of equality and trying to kind of create a sustainable and, and just future I think is the other thing yeah no, and I, I I you know in my little world I feel like it's very different now than it was three years ago five years or ten years ago I think you know in particular a younger generation is saying well hang on that isn't right you know and um yeah. you know I think um I think that, that you know, there's a great opportunity for us to determine our own destiny, isn't there? So, so I'm going to move to a couple of the questions. We've, we've had a couple that I'll, I'll try and kind of paraphrase it and bring them forward to give you an opportunity to have a think about and maybe comment on. So Abdullah's talked about um, the kind of future of coffee and he's talked about the chance to produce locally. I'm not entirely um, sure I, I, I fully grasp that, but there is this kind of... Uh, increasing interest in direct as well as kind of fair trade. So I just wondered kind of, is that a space that Cafe Direct's thought of? What's the... Um, I'll try and answer a few of those questions here. I mean, the direct thing is interesting because I think, you know, Cafe Direct was probably the, one of the first direct businesses. It's, it's called Cafe Direct. Um, when we started, there wasn't fair trade. So, you know, we we started by meeting some farmers and buying coffee directly from them um, for a higher price and then selling it in church halls and community centers and stuff like that and so we were one of the the founders of direct trade as as the fair trade movement built up you've then got some quite artisan looking coffee firms calling it direct trade i think um i think a close relationship with you know a farmer and um as close as you can get to the consumer is a great thing I think the reason I'm pausing is, you know, the good thing about certification is it means somebody independent is making sure you're paying a fair price and you're investing your money in your purpose rather than just talking the, the, the stuff, you're actually doing it. So I think there, there is real benefit in an independent audit to say this is real um, rather than everybody just going, oh yeah, we're natural, we're direct, yeah, trust us. Um, I guess, if you want to look under the bonnet of businesses, I think it's always good to look at the ownership of a company. I think if you if you find a, a business, you know, where it's clearly owned by shareholders who are trying to make a lot of money, and if you bother to look at their articles of association on Companies House, you saw that their purpose was about making themselves a load of money. You know, it's pretty clear that that isn't a a business that's trying to change the world and trying to have positive impacts. So I think I think direct is good. But where it's trying to be a substitute for certification, it's a bit naughty, I think. There you go. Yeah. So, um, it, in terms, it, it, oh, go I was going to say, in terms of the future of coffee, I mean, at the moment, the way coffee is grown naturally, you need altitude. And so it's very difficult to grow it beyond a certain number of uh, regions. And um, uh, so I think the way it's grown currently naturally, it's hard to see it being grown in the UK, even on the tallest kind of points. Because they're they're not they're not tall enough, and they certainly haven't got the right climate. Um, I think you know there's a number of people looking at how do you cultivate coffee in other ways. Because as climate change um, you know marches through many of these countries, the fragile smallholder farmer communities are going to find it harder and harder to grow things like coffee and tea and cocoa. So you know at the moment the answer is no, but you know there are people saying how can we ad adapt either the plants or the way uh, coffee is grown. 
Okay. No, that's great. I'm going to jump to a question from Nick uh, here, who's really kind of a bit more of an insight about you, I guess. Uh, you, you told us a bit about your career and how you kind of uh, went into the dark room, started thinking about the, the idea for your own business. But I mean, so Nick's asking, what are the key characteristics that you think you need for starting a business? And when you kind of um, left your career to, to embark mm -hmm. on this journey, was that full time? Was it part time? How did you go about that? Yeah, good, good question, Nick. God, it takes me back. Um, I mean, I think I'd always wanted to do run my own business. So when I when I was at college, I um, I had a friend called Nick Hart, and we ran a company called Heart of Steel. Um, and we organised balls and parties in Oxford and stuff, which meant we had balls and parties, and we also you know had a bit of business and stuff. Um, so I think I'd always wanted to run my own business. And I think if you feel that way, there is then a there's then a slight dilemma because if you you know, in my day, you didn't start a business when you came out of college. You went and got trained and you built your career. Um, I think you can start a business whenever you want to. I mean, the, the dilemma is if you if you do it later on, you perhaps have more understanding of some of the risks. But you're also probably at a life stage that means you're more risk averse and less likely to do it. And certainly I'd always wanted to do it and I got to. It's going to sound like a very middle-aged man story. I got to 40 and I said to myself, well, I can spend the next 25 years going, I could do my own business. I could do my own business, but I do not want to be 65 going, oh, I wish I'd done my own business. So I um, I decided I would do it. And, and so that's what I did. So I think um, if you have a passion to, to be your own boss and to learn, um, then it's quite amazing i think the the key characteristics are you know i don't think you need to have a, a a rocket science idea i think you just need to have belief in something and something that can compete and be distinct enough to be successful um i did start it full time and i did go from you know big company big salary car to no salary no prospect of salary you know, raising money, um, managing, you know, creditors like it was, you know, managing cash like it was something you'd never really experienced before. So I think I did go, I did go full on. I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think if you're looking at doing that, it's best to approach it with a part-time attitude or at least learn enough about it. I mean, I, I, I knew the market I wanted to go into. I, I was disillusioned at the time with the concentration of power in the UK supermarket industry. And I wanted to build a tech business that connected people's homes with them wherever they were. So it was very much a bit like a, a business like Hive that we have now. And um, it was high tech. It was completely out of food and drink. I remember a friend of mine, a guy called Wilfred, who, who um, Wilfred Emmanuel Jones, who has a business called The Black Farmer, um, I was helping him at the time um, sell sausages into supermarkets and things. And he said to me, you know, not only are you starting your own business, but you're starting in something you have no idea about. Do you think you're taking on too much? And yeah, clearly I was. And um, so I think my advice would be, you know, choose something that you love and that you know, and that you can be highly competitive with. But, um, you know, don't, you know, hey, I, I, I enjoyed doing it. Um, it. People would look at it and go, it's a bit risky and a bit off piece, but I learned a lot that's made me better at what I do nowadays. No, very good. And I mean, it might have been in at the deep end, but it's worked out okay. I think it's oh, yeah. the, uh, yeah. from where I, having been a professor of entrepreneurship and studying entrepreneurs, I, I think I've lost my, my nerve. Uh, I don't think I could <laughs> do it anymore because you see all of the, uh, the risks as well as the upside but if it wasn't for the entrepreneurs we wouldn't have the world that we do um, and yeah. i've got time for one last question if i may and then um i don't know um, maybe molly um i'll invite you back to tell us about what's coming up um, in future uh, with some of these as well but dickler's made a comment around um the kind of the scaling of, of businesses and the challenge to retain purpose retain that vision and values and i just wondered if if maybe that's quite a nice point to to finish on it and what's been the kind of the experience and the challenge with cafe direct around that uh i think i think it's very important that 
and we touched on it earlier that you you have very strong governance and that you you cement your purpose into the organization so you know when you when you have articles of association they need to be quite explicit about your your mission and the way you're going to deliver it so if you if you read cafe directs articles it's very explicit about having producers on the board of directors it's very explicit about reinvesting profitability in um, farms so i think you need to cement your purpose into your um, founding documents then i think you need to govern the business so that you can't go away from it so we have a we have a golden share um, owned by a construct called the guardian share company which is um, run by a combination of the farmers and oxfam and uh, another of our ethical partners and so they have a blocking kind of vote so i think you need to you need to cement your purpose into your founding documents and then you need to have a governance structure that prevents people from just messing around with it in a way then it's easy i mean for us we can be as entrepreneurial as sophisticated as um, brand orientated as we want to be but there are red lines that we're not able to change I think that's really interesting and, and like you say that establishing those red lines understanding what kind of organization you want to be uh, and the impact you can have is absolutely key to achieving it I think that it's thinking beyond that status quo yeah and, it, and it's actually quite liberating because if you've got that um, explicitly you know how much freedom you've got and and you won't you won't lose sight of your purpose but you can still be an agile competitive entrepreneurial organization John, I thank you so much for your time this evening. I'm delighted that you still have links to Brooks and that you are one of our entrepreneurs in residence. And it, it's great to be able to share your story with those that have been able to join us this evening. I'd, I'd like to thank all of those that have um, dialed in. Uh, thank you for the questions. I apologise. There's been a couple that, um, given the time, we haven't managed to quite squeeze in. But again, John, thank you. And I'll hand back over to Molly. No, thank you, Tim. Can you hear me? <clears throat> okay, hi. Um, thank you very much um, to both of you, to Tim and to John. It's been a really interesting um, evening. I, for some reason, I haven't put my camera on. It's time to put my camera on. Might help. Start my camera. Yeah, we can you see me? We can see you. Yeah. Oh. Now or not? It's like the hokey cokey. We can't anymore. All right. Okay. There we go. Let's, one That's more it. time. Um, there we go. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's you. you. Brilliant. You. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. So it's been really interesting. And I've, I've wanted to uh, talk to John for a few years now. We keep on um, back and forth of email. So it's been such so interesting to hear about your journey and, and your work uh, also at Oxford Brooks now as a, as a visiting entrepreneur. And thank you very much for hosting tonight as well and sharing, um, Tim. Um, it's been great for your input with your background and your knowledge on entrepreneurship. Um, so we're, this is the first um, uh, series, of the, it's a series of the uh, inspirational journeys and the next one we're running is this Thursday from 5pm. It's um, hosted by um, Professor Bill Gibson. Um, he's from the he's a professor at the um, humanities department at Brooks and we've also he's going to be interviewing the Iman <clears throat> Monava Hussein, who is the High Sheriff of Oxfordshire. Um, so we're looking forward to hearing his journey um, from his journey into being an Iman in Eton and also his work with social, social um, diversity and cohesion in Oxfordshire. So carrying on after that, we're going to have webinars every either Tuesday or Thursday throughout March um, until the beginning of April. So I hope everyone's enjoyed this evening and there's been some really interesting questions as well. And looking forward to tuning in for the next uh, seminar on Thursday. Thank you very much um, and have a good evening, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.